Amen. Did you mute me? <laughs> Had a mutiny going on back there. <laughs> a mute me. You see, yeah. I, yeah, I see, you saw what I did there. All right, if you would like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 2, verse 1. And if you do not have your Bible, have no fear. I'm going to read it to you anyways. As soon as I find it. <laughs> That's John. It shouldn't be that hard, right? Hey, I did want to mention, um, I want to thank you guys for praying for us for while we were away in San Diego. I um, also forgot to mention, if you would please pray for us again this week, uh, as Eric and I are going to travel to Kansas City um, for a few days. Also for business, <laughs> the last, hopefully, of our trade shows for maybe a very long time. <laughs> we were blessed, though, with really great travel. I mean, great weather. Um, God definitely blessed us, I believe, while we were in the, the show there and gave us some opportunities uh, to just make some connections uh, that I know where God is in control of all of them. So, But pray for us this week, too. So we're going to Kansas City, Missouri. Um, did you know there were two Kansas cities? Yeah. Okay. You did know that? I didn't know that. I thought Kansas City was in Kansas, and I thought that must be a typo. <laughs> there are two Kansas cities. That's awesome. So we're going Kansas City, Missouri. A uh, very quick um, fly in on Tuesday, coming back on Saturday, working the whole time. So, um, But it's, it's going to be good. So we are John chapter 2. Verse 1 says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Dear woman. Now, I have to say this because every time I read dear woman, I think it sounds like he's being mean. <laughs> woman, what do you want from me? <laughs> but he says dear woman, which actually is um, a sign of respect that he says to his mother. But I think in our, our, our you know, 21st century translation, we're like, woman? He calls his mother woman, <laughs> right? So anyways, he says, dear woman, imagine him saying this with, with respect. <laughs> Why do you involve me? Jesus replied, my time has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial, er, ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. So they're pretty big. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. And then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so, and the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. Makes sense, right? Okay, <laughs> so, but here is wedding etiquette, just so you know, in Jesus' time. <laughs> bring out the cheaper wine later on. He says, bring out the cheaper wine when they've had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. This the first of his miraculous signs Jesus performed at Cana in Galilee. He thus revealed his glory and his disciples put their faith in him. So I don't know about you. This miracle of Jesus turning water into wine, to me, I just never really got it, okay? <laughs> I'll just be honest with you right from the beginning. All right, so Jesus turns water into wine. First of all, as a child learning about it, I think, what's the big deal? 
I don't even drink wine, <laughs> right? So what is this big deal that Jesus t- turns water into wine? I mean, this is his coming out miracle, right? This is the I am the Messiah. I'm going to prove it to you in the most miraculous way of all ways, and it is I am going to turn water into wine. And you think, oh, come on, Jesus, you can do better than that. Come on, you did. You caused the blind to see. A man who was blind from a time he was born that has never happened before gets to see. I mean, he gets those people that are lame, they, he regrows their feet and they can walk. He takes people's lives, changes them around. They're begging at the gate one day, and they are dancing in the synagogue the next day, right? They now have a life. Jesus, I mean, he raised Lazarus from the dead. Come on. Nothing greater than that, right? He he fed thousands of people with some fish and some bread. And so Jesus is coming out miracle seems a bit superfluous to me. It is turning water into wine. Nobody really needed wine, did they? Were they going to die if they didn't have the wine? (sighs) No. (laughs) His mommy made him do it. But when you look at it this way, come on, guys, this is where I'm at with it. I'm like, I don't understand why this miracle is such a big deal. But John, who I have nicknamed the smartest of all disciples, um, he gives us a clue by calling it a miraculous sign. John actually refers to many of Jesus' miracles as miraculous signs. And I think John really gets it. He's the only one actually to record Jesus' first miracle, right? You think that would make all the books, right? <laughs> but it doesn't. Only John records it. I feel like John, like I said, he is the smartest of all the disciples, and he understands what's going on here. And I think as we look at this miracle, we will see a little bit deeper. What is a sign? A sign is something that tells you something, right? It can be quite important when you're driving on the road, right? Um, or off the road, (laughs) if it says dead end, (laughs) you know, it's very important. Signs are something that we should pay attention to. And as we dig deeper, I think we'll find that this miracle is really about change. It is about real, real, real change. See, we all want and seek change. Raise your hand if there's something you'd like to change. All right, everybody's hands raised. Uh, At home, I'm sure your hands are all raised too. (laughs) We all want and seek change in our life. That is something that we all look for. It's this thing that uh, TV shows are made of, right? (laughs) So you ever watch The Biggest Loser? Anybody in Biggest Loser fans? You ever watched it, Miss Joy? You guys watch The Biggest Loser? Okay, so The Biggest Loser is... um, contestants that weigh hundreds of pounds, five, six hundred pounds, these people want to change their life, right? So they go on The Biggest Loser and they go to the ranch, (laughs) okay, where they don't milk cows. (laughs) They go to the ranch and they learn how to eat right, how to have a positive attitude, how to exercise. They exercise literally their butts off, okay? So they are running on on treadmills. You see people, I mean, no kidding, the kids and I, we used to go to the gym, right, Jax? We'd go to the gym, two-hour show, (laughs) walk on the treadmill, because we aren't running for two hours. <laughs> so we're walking on the treadmill for two hours watching The Biggest Loser and week after week after week, and you would see change. They would go from 500 pounds to 400 pounds to 300 pounds, and by the end of six months, these people would be down to like 150-pound trained athletes who are running marathons, half marathons, and you're like, wow, I am just drudging along on the treadmill, right? 
at like 3.8 miles per hour, <laughs> okay? We are just for two hours, that's what I'm doing. And it's so inspiring to see these people change. But the real reality of this, Biggest Loser was on for 17 seasons. The true reality of this is that almost every single one of the contestants gained all their weight back. Some even more than what they weighed before they were on the show. That is sad. Change is hard to find, isn't it? Maybe you can't uh, relate to yo-yo dieting or weight problems. <laughs> so let's talk about the lottery for a moment. Lots of people play the lottery all the time, right? Why do they play the lottery? Because they think if they win the lottery, their life is going to change, right? And so the sad reality here is that 70% of jackpot winners, jackpot winners, declare bankruptcy. They're in a worse place than they were before they started. It seems that true change, true real change, seems to evade us, doesn't it? My grandfather would say, the more things change, the more they say the same. He lived 96 years. You know, he just passed away a couple months ago. And he would always say that. He'd say, you know, Danny, because that's what he'd call me. <laughs> People's struggles today are the same struggles they had when I was in my 20s. In the 30s, the 40s, there are still people hungry, there are still people broke, there are still people wanting love, there are still people with broken hearts, there are still people suffering the same things now in 2019 as they did when I was 19 myself. And it's true. It's really true. Change is something that is very, very difficult for us to find. And God gave me this picture about what change is, and I'm going to show you here for a moment. I have uh, some flowers over here in a nice little pot here. And God says we think change is this. You guys ready? This is what we think change is. Okay, we think this is change, right? We think change is the cut flower in this, well, soon-to-be coffin we call a vase, right? <laughs> we think change is that, but God says that change is this. He says that's change. You see, we think change is the cut flower, but he says change is the pruned plant. So let me explain to you a little bit about the pruning process. Scientists had to figure out why does pruning work? What is it that we know that it works, but what happens that makes it work? And it's this thing called apical dominance. I taught you a new word. <laughs> apical dominance. And it's the first shoot. And it inhibits the growth of all the other shoots. So what happens is when the seed is planted, this first shoot comes up. And when it reaches and gets the sun, it produces this hormone called auxin. And what it does is it takes auxin down that stem, and it goes down into the roots, and the roots grow. And when the roots grow, they get nutrients from the soil, and they cause the shoot to grow, right? Now, that stem only has enough room for so much auxin to be in it. So what will happen is another shoot will grow off. Another shoot can't get the oxen back into the stem because the stem is full up from that original shoot that's in there. So for a shoot to be active, it must take 
oxen down to the root, and the root must give nutrients to the stem. And it only gives nutrients when oxen can get down into the stem. So what happens with a plant as it grows, that original shoot becomes so strong that it inhibits the growth of the others. So when we cut it back and we prune it, that oxen-filled stem is no longer filled with that oxen. It can begin to receive that oxen from all of the other stems. And so what happens is pruning disrupts this process by opening up that main stem to receive the oxen from the other branches. And what happens is it creates a stronger, right, an overall more fruitful plant. So you might be thinking to yourself, where did you go, Danielle? <laughs> Why are we all of a sudden talking about the scientific process of pruning? <laughs> what does that have to do with water and wine? So I will ask you the question, what changes water into wine? The answer is the grapevine. The roots gather the water, right? Makes the vine grow, and the grapevine grows the grapes, which end up becoming wine eventually. So it is the grapevine that changes water into wine. And this is where John really shines, <laughs> because John is listening to Jesus, and he talks to Jesus in chapter 15, and he records a conversation that he has with Jesus and his disciples, and Jesus says, I am the vine. What changes water into wine? The vine. Who is the vine? Jesus. We're going to go to John chapter 15. That's why I say he's the smart disciple. <laughs> so having recorded this miracle of changing water into wine, John now records this conversation that he has with Jesus. And it's John chapter 15, and we're going to start with verse 1. It says, Jesus speaking, these words are in red, I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you, but remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, we are looking at the single flower that I cut out and put in its vase. What is its future? <sighs> it's not going to make it, is it? <laughs> it's not going to live. That vase eventually becomes its coffin, right? That flower looks very beautiful right there. It might be out of there, but it is not going to live. It may have changed its circumstances, it has changed its circumstances, but truly it has a result of death coming. He says, remain in me and I will remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be given to you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourself to be my disciples. Jesus is the vine. And this miracle of Jesus changing water into wine is exactly a miracle of who he is. He is the vine. He is the one and the only one who can bring about true and real change in our lives. 
For us, apical dominance, the first shoot is all about the first atom. It's our main struggle, isn't it? Us, me, 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 <laughs> right? It's our self, it's our flesh, it's the sin in our lives, and it is the pruning process that God brings us through that makes us more fruitful. Outside of Jesus, outside of the vine, we can do nothing. And I love this miracle that he uses these vats that were used for ceremonial cleansing. They were used to make yourself presentable and clean before God. It was part of the Jewish custom to clean yourself. And Jesus takes those vats pours water into it, and it changes into wine. And Jesus, isn't it wine Jesus holds up at the Last Supper? It is his blood. It is what makes us holy and presentable for God. You see, he is the true change maker. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And this miracle is the most hopeful of all miracles. And I love that the miracle happens when it's poured in and filled up to the brim because that's what happens in our lives. You see, when we let Jesus pour into us and we get filled up to the brim, well, that's when the changes, real change, starts to happen in our lives. And what happens with the pruning process as you cut off that first shoot, that first one that came up. But if you let it go long enough, the next one, guess what that one is? It becomes the first one. And you gotta prune that one too. Then the next one. <laughs> and the next one. And the next one. And I don't know about you. I've been right here. Oh, yeah. I've been right here, this place, this plant, with all of the blooming parts seemingly cut off in my life, and everything that I thought was so great, so grand, so splendorous is now gone. And here I am. But thank God I'm not here. You see, the cut-off stem has no future. The cut-off stem has no life. The cut-off stem will die, and there is nothing you can do to save it. But the pruned plant, oh, hallelujah. You see, the pruned plant is a place of expectation. You see, there are promises just waiting to happen. There are things that God said will come true, and those things are going to happen in the pruned plant, but they are never going to happen in the cut-off stem. Real change happens here. when We have the guts to let God do that to us. We are in a place of hope. You see, this miracle was a demonstration of God's power in our lives. If you want real change, we are only going to find it in Christ alone. We must remain in the vine and allow ourselves to be pruned. And when we allow God to cut off those things of ourselves, we become stronger. We had to this wisteria plant by our house. And um, when we first moved to the house, this wisteria plant was there. And I would drive down the road and see all the other wisteria plants at everybody's house. They were gorgeous. <laughs> I mean, wisteria is a beautiful plant. Beautiful grape-like leaf or flower clusters that are like purple and blue, and they're just gorgeous, and that's the vine that grows, and it just hangs off of things, and it's just splendorous. And our wisteria plant was lame, okay? <laughs> I'm telling you, we had like two blooms on it, 
the first year we were there. And uh, everybody kept saying, you got to cut it back. And I was like, oh, I only got two blooms. I ain't going to cut those off, man. They're, they're so pretty. I don't want to cut them off. I mean, it's the only thing I got are these two blooms on my wisteria plant. If I, I mean, I'm shameful in the plants of wisterias. All the neighbors are like, look at her wisteria. She's only got two blooms. And theirs is like glorious and beautiful. And everybody kept saying, you got to cut it back. You got to cut it back. You got to cut it back. One year I listened. I cut it back. The next year, nothing, not a, not a single bloom, nothing. I was like, that didn't work. <laughs> What's up with that? You people don't know nothing about your wisteries. I had like three blooms and they're all gone and now I have nothing. Oh, but the next year, the next year we had Tons of wisteria blooms on that plant all over. In fact, it knocked over our porch and everything. <laughs> it was so heavy. That wisteria plant was so beautiful. You see, this is the most hopeful of all miracles. You know why? We are not all blind, are we? We're not all lame. Some of us are lame. <laughs> It's the other lame. But no, we're not all lame, right? We're not all um, lepers. Hopefully we're all alive. So we may not need all of those miracles. But this miracle is a miracle for everyone. See, sometimes God prunes us, and it's not necessarily a pleasant process. Amen? But if God cuts something out, he's bringing back something even better. He intends to make you more fruitful for the kingdom. You see, God pruned this plant because he saw something bigger and better that was going to come from it. And it's the same way in our lives. A time will be coming. Jesus changes water into wine. Kind of makes you look at it differently, doesn't it? Well, you got to be in the vine. You got to be in the vine. And you know the beautiful thing about this is that Jesus has already done all the work. Died on a cross, accepted the punishment for everything in our lives. He has made a way for us to be with God. You just got to hang on the vine a little bit longer, guys. It's all right. You're still waiting for some. Just hang on a little bit longer. Jesus has done it. It is finished. Change, which makes us presentable to God, has been done. Just stay in the vine. Hang on there a little bit longer. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes for just a moment. We'll have a revelation rest here. I want you to ask God sincerely, is there something that needs to be pruned in me? I mean, are you sincere enough with God to ask him? Do you trust him enough to receive his answer? Is it a cry of your heart to be more fruitful in the kingdom? Because if it is, it starts with being pruned right now where you're at. God, we just ask right now that you would show and reveal to us in our lives the things that seem to be dominating that are not of you. Father, you would prune, cut those things out from our lives because we don't want to be in a place where we are ultimately just a flower sitting in the vase waiting to die. Well, Father, we would rather be in the hands of the master gardener who knows what we need who knows everything that needs to be cut out, 
everything that needs to be cared for and is willing to do that for us. Father, speak to our hearts. Thank you, God, for the gift of this miracle. This is a miracle that touches each and every one of our lives. Change, real change. This world will give us pseudo change. There's a lot of places we can turn for that. But today, Father, we turn to you for the real and true change in our lives. Thank you, Jesus. 